Coming up on today's Airborne, it's time to get specific. ANN is pondering the 2014 best sport planes, and we need your help. The spending bill funds unleaded fuel testing, and Beechcraft celebrates the 50th anniversary of its King Air's first flight. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. Now that we at ANN have seen all that was new and novel at this year's 2014 U.S. Sport Aviation Expo, it's time to put together this year's list of what we consider to be the best flyer's dozen and sport aircraft available. But we need your input. We're going to put together profiles of all the likely contenders and we want your input as to what airframe deserves top honors this year. Our best of breed is assembled by experts with a true passion for sport aviation and long-term expertise in the field. But we want to know what you think because a successful sport plane is one that the sport aviation community judges and selects for themselves. You have a few days to think about it and then you can send us your suggestion for the best of breed sport plane of the year 2014 to jim at aero-news.net. The Omnibus Appropriations Bill of 2014, passed by Congress, includes language to fund the Piston Aviation Fuels Initiative. Tom Patton reports. The initiative is an FAA industry partnership charged with evaluating candidate fuels and developing data to support fleet-wide certification for their use. It's also a key step on the road toward transitioning to a high-octane, unleaded piston aviation fuel. The appropriation is slightly above the requested level through fiscal year 2014, and the fact that the current FAA budget authorization is for a three-year duration means that this level of funding would also likely continue at least through FY 2016. EAA Vice President of Government Relations Doug McNair said inclusion of funding for the research, quote, keeps us on track for a managed, sustainable, and safe transition to a high-octane unleaded replacement for 100 low lead. The spending bill contained other measures to help GA, including funding for the contract tower program and a renewal of language prohibiting user fees. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. Beechcraft Corporation recognized the 50th anniversary of the first flight of the King Air Model 90 last week with several three-ship passes of the company's current production King Air models over its home airfield, Beechfield, in Wichita, Kansas, as employees and guests watched. Company pilots flew the first official flight of the conforming prototype of the King Air Model 90 on January 20, 1964. With five aircraft in the test program, the King Air received type certification from the FAA just four months later on May 27. First customer deliveries began in July. Thus began the reign of the King. Last week's three-ship 50th anniversary flight included the King Air C90 GTX based on the original Model 90 design, as well as the King Air 250 and the flagship King Air 350i. Bill Boister, CEO of Beechcraft, said, quote, The significance of that flight 50 years ago cannot be overstated, nor can the work of Beechcrafters over the past five decades to turn that one model into the legendary King Air brand. The first Boeing 787 Dreamliner, built at the rate of 10 airplanes per month, has been rolled off the assembly line. The airplane, a 787-8, and the 155th Dreamliner built will be delivered to the International Lease Finance Corporation for operation by Aeromexico. The new 10 per month rate is the highest ever for a twin-aisle airplane. The 787 program has now increased its production rate three times in just over a year, including to five airplanes per month in November of 2012 and at seven per month in May of 2013. Boeing plans to increase the production rate to 12 per month in 2016 and to 14 per month by the end of the decade. To date, 115 787s have been delivered to 16 customers. The program has 1,030 total orders 
from 60 customers worldwide. Virgin Galactic says it has reached a significant milestone in the testing of a new family of liquid rocket engines. As part of a rapid development program, Virgin Galactic has now hot-fired both a 3,500-foot pound thrust rocket engine and a 47,500 pound thrust rocket engine, called the Newton 1 and Newton 2 respectively. The new rocket engines were designed and assembled in-house by Virgin Galactic engineers and technicians and mark the first firings of engines designed and built by the privately funded company. As part of the ongoing test program, the Newton 1 engine has now been fired dozens of times, achieving the target thrust during a full duration test. The test team has successfully completed as many as six distinct test firings in a single day. The larger Newton 2 engine has also been fired multiple times at short duration, with longer duration firing scheduled to occur in the coming months. Both engines were custom designed by Virgin Galactic to serve as the propulsion system for the Launcher 1 satellite launch vehicle. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. ADS-V will be mandatory for most aircraft by 2020 in the United States. But you can benefit from ADS-V today with the Bendix King KT-74 Mode S Transponder. The KT-74 meets the global mandates for ADS-V out when attached to a suitable WASP GPS. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds and learning proper crosswind landing techniques. Even today, most crosswind landing skills are learned through trial and error, sometimes with disastrous results. Believe it or not, the most common contributing factor in weather-related accidents each year is crosswinds. The second most common factor is wind gusts. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. It teaches pilots the proper techniques to meet and beat these top two causes of weather-related landing accidents. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in challenging crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird flight simulations, the Redbird X-Wind SE, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website, or our podcast, drop us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. And the latest example of NASA Kennedy Space Center's transformation into a multi-user spaceport, Sierra Nevada Corporation of Louisville, Colorado, announced last Thursday the steps it will take to prepare for a November 2016 orbital flight of its Dream Chaser spacecraft from Florida Space Coast. The announcement included the purchase of an Atlas V rocket from United Launch Alliance for the launch, sharing the operations and checkout development and testing facility with Lockheed Martin Space Systems, establishing an operation center at Kennedy Space Center, and using the former shuttle landing facility runway at Kennedy. The Dream Chaser spacecraft is designed to carry crew and critical cargo to destinations, as well as performing servicing and science in low Earth orbit. SNC said it intends to complete the Dream Chaser mission with a landing on the three and a half mile runway at the shuttle landing facility. Steve Lindsay, a former NASA astronaut and SNC's senior director, is the Dream Chaser's program manager and a veteran of five space shuttle flights. The U.S. Navy will receive some $200 million in aircraft and services from Boeing and General Dynamics to repay that branch of the military for a program that was canceled in 1991. The canceled program was the A-12 Avenger II. The program ran into development problems in the 1980s and was finally scrapped by the Defense Secretary Dick Cheney in 1991. Reuters reports that the government had demanded repayment for $1.3 billion when the programs were canceled. Boeing and General Dynamic had sued the government to keep the money and receive more than a billion dollars in additional compensation for the program 
that they said the government had improperly terminated. The decision, which was announced by the Justice Department on Thursday, indicates that the government will not pay any money to the two companies. Under the agreement, the Navy will receive three EA-186 Growler aircraft from Boeing and a $200 million credit from General Dynamics for work on a destroyer. And now it's time for our Aero Video of the Week. On the first moon landing, the Eagle almost ran out of fuel because it had to divert to a new landing site. This video shows how modern technology solves this problem. Search G-Fold Diversion Test on YouTube. It's been a long time coming, but volunteers report that they have made significant progress restoring the Boeing B-29 Superfortress named Doc, since work resumed on the project in 2013. Newly restored engines are being installed on the aircraft in preparation of the next major milestone known as Power On. Volunteers are targeting a first flight for later this year. The Boeing B-29 has been in Wichita undergoing restoration since the year 2000. Restoration accelerated earlier this year with additional funding and the donation of a hangar to finish the restoration. In 2013, Doc's friends was formed to help preserve the history of the legendary warbird. TJ Norman, Doc's friend's project manager, said, quote, In order to take the restoration to the next level, we are looking for an experienced aircraft electrician, engine and flight control mechanics, sheet metal mechanics, and inspectors. End quote. We're watching the progress of this project and we'll keep you posted. The Aircraft Electronics Association has announced a partnership agreement with the NextGen GA Fund to accelerate the rollout of NextGen by providing access to quick, affordable financial incentives to aid aircraft owners. The NextGen GA Fund will finance NextGen installations using stipulated equipage families to include WAS-capable GPS, ADSBN, ADSBL, RNAV, RNP avionics, data communications, SWIM, flat panel displays, antennas, electronic components, instrument panel modifications, and installation and certification cost. The NextGen GA Fund is a public-private partnership formed between the U.S. Congress, the aerospace industry, and the private sector investment community. The NextGen GA Fund will initially bring approximately $550 million as a capital base, eventually supporting some $1.3 billion in recurring financing to the general aviation sector during the next 10 years. The NextGen GA Fund will enable the retrofit of tens of thousands of GA aircraft. Facilitated through the AEA and a special AEA web portal available this spring, AEA member repair stations will be able to quickly and seamlessly refer customers to the NextGen GA Fund as a financing alternative to help provide the necessary resources in accomplishing important upgrades for more than 157,000 general aviation aircraft. As AEA's longtime media partner for their annual convention and trade show, ANN will be covering this extensively starting March 12th. Well, that's our program. Remember to get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. Please remember Airborne is streamed twice weekly and is always online. And stay tuned for our new schedule for 2014. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.